no problem. Okay, this is better. All right. Uh, thanks, Klaus. And um, yeah, I'm actually very uncomfortable with that ear mic because it keeps falling off. My my ears are not very well aligned. <laughs> so I'll uh, just hold hold this thing in hand and and give it a shot. Yeah. Uh, morning. Good morning, and thanks for uh, thanks for showing up early in the morning. I. Um, I, I love Hacklu very much. It's one of my absolute favorite events. But they always put me up in the morning talk, which is a challenge. Anyway, so uh, thanks for being here. Um, this, so after, after, after about 10 years uh, coming to Hacklu, I decided I want to change up the uh, theme a little bit. I've been doing offensive stuff all, all my career, thinking of new ways of attacking and you know, figuring out where we get blocked when the defense catches up, and then we kind of innovate our way, our way out and come up with a new attack. So I, I started thinking, especially from my customer's viewpoint, what a pain I must be to all of them uh, to, to block me or to defend against uh, attacks that are coming. And I, I started taking a, a, a higher level look at InfoSec thinking, okay, you know, we've been doing this for almost 20 years. Something needs to change. I mean, security is actually pretty strange. But while I was thinking, I thought, we do have, actually, in, in fact, today, we, we do have an opportunity to change the way we do defense, to come up with a more proactive methodology for defense, and actually succeed while doing defense, not to just, you know, get blocked by the next attack. So um, my name is Saumil Shah. And the theme of the talk, the, the thought process was today's attacks succeed because the defense is reactive. We've, we've spent all our years chasing the attacker's tails. We've seen a new type of attack. We've then scrambled to defend against it. Uh, it. It works for a while. It keeps the new attacks at bay. But then the attacks evolve. And the attacks have started evolving very fast, way faster than traditional defense can now keep up. So you're looking at a company that can produce a box with blinking lights, starts pushing it out in the market. It gets installed everywhere to be used for about six months, and then it um, sort of stays there. The lights keep on blinking, and there's a process built around it. And then you go and look for a new box. This is no fun. So what, what do we need to do? I, I'm going to divide this talk into two parts. The, the first part is kind of, OK, how we got here. And the second part is, all right, what do we do about it? So if you start tracing back from say, 10, 15 years ago, and look at where targets have been, targets have shifted. When, when I started pen testing, it was all about servers. Then it moved. The uh, targets follow the path of least resistance. So as, as one area starts getting hard, you open up a new area. You go to applications, desktops, browsers, and now the attacks follow the, the pockets. You, you're carrying kind of an attack with you wherever you go. <clears throat> and now, of course, there's the whole Internet of Things thingy out there, which, uh, which also is a vast attack career. Uh, the motivation of attacks, a lot of people have talked about it. The motivation is very clear. It's all about the money. Whenever you can figure out a way of making money, you have an attack technique coming up for that. And just when we thought we had a handle on DDoS, well, here we go, DDoS to the max again, and probably take out a whole nation with the kind of uh, flood that we saw from the botnet of things. So actually, I had to update the slide. Today's fashion is no longer breaches. It is terabit DDoS. But yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a trend. Every year, there's a, there's a trend of attacks coming in. There's Next year, there's a new trend. Breaches have now become so commonplace that yeah, you used to get really excited. Oh, wow, Sony got hacked, and they got owned, and they got like slaughtered through the press. But there's not enough press, not, not the same magnitude of press about Yahoo. It's like, OK, we've become numb to it. 
yeah, breaches will happen. Oh shit, there goes our passwords again. And we, 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 we kind of just, we don't bother about it. We, we close down our Yahoo account and open up some other junk email account to collect spam. Um, I wonder if, if Google gets breached, uh, what, what are we going to do? Um, but how have we been behaving as far as defense goes over the past 16 years? We've, we've kind of tried to restrict everything, somewhat like the city of Gondor. We've, you know, had walls. We've, we've built walls in circles all the way to the inner core. So we, we first started with the perimeter and then we started with, uh, you know, securing applications, endpoints, desktops. And yeah, there are, there are creative souls out there. So yeah, you, you, you got all your firewalls and IDS and DEP and sandboxes only to be circumvented by techniques created by smart people. And what do we learn from this? Hacks happen. They will always happen. Yes, there is control flow integrity checking. Yes, there is shadow stack. Yes, there is you know CPU level stuff that is being built in. And I'm sure some smart people will figure out a way tomorrow how to get around it. Um, you kind of keep going down the hole, the hole doesn't end. The hole probably ends when everything blows up and you reach the core. Bo bo both attackers and defenders die. Um, or when the matrix finally swallows us. Uh, but uh, going down the hole is, is not an option. You're just, you're making it harder. You're not, not really stopping the attack. And uh, I kind of, last year I did a talk on Stegosploit, how to encode a browser exploit entirely onto pixels and kind of make it invisible to eyes that scan content. It, it travels as a real picture. This, this one is actually a, an exploit. It is a browser exploit which will trigger on IE9. It's painted on Kevin McPeak's face. You just don't see the pixels. I did this talk last year at Hackaloo, and I've been working on this for about four years and completed the whole thing in the hacker space in Luxembourg. So I decided to talk about it. But uh, when I reflect back onto why Stegosploit happens, it's exactly the reason. You are being blocked, so you kind of figure out a new way of tunneling attacks or carrying attacks on images. You just find creative ways of packing things together to make it succeed. Um, I read a really nice blog on architecture, and somebody described this concept of Nakatomi space. This appealed to me very much, and in InfoSec, it's exactly like this. Uh, Nakatomi space is basically you can traverse interiors in ways that they were never intended to be traversed. Like Bruce Willis can move up and down a multi-storied uh, building, um, without using traditional means of access. And as infrastructure goes complex, there is more and more Nakatomi space being added into everything. File formats, networks, like stack memory, wherever you think, there, there, there's some little gaps, some little ways in and out that an attacker can use and traverse through it in a manner not intended for, for use, and this is where all the attacks actually come from. Can we really try and block Nakatomi space? No, it, it, it's a part and parcel of the infrastructure. It, it just comes, it, it's given. You can't really clamp it down. Um, if we look at how exploit developers were, like about 12 years ago, there's a photograph from uh, 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 is a photograph from Black Hat uh, 2003, we used to write exploit for the lols. It was fun, we could own everything, and then we could brag about it. Today, if you're going to write exploits, it's a huge effort. There's no publicly available exploits around. There's the, the money has gone up, and exploits have kind of gotten really weaponized, and they've, they've taken place in like serious offensive tactics. So what does this mean for defense? The defenders try to react against this as well. Say, okay, we cannot find publicly disclosed bugs, and um, where well, we try to screw over the researchers by forcing them into legal battles, so the researchers said, no more free bugs, we're not gonna tell you, and they started using it um, for themselves. So what did the defenders do? They tried to buy back their bugs. Enter the concept of bug bounties. 
is a great start the thought process was 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 good it was designed for i mean it it came about for addressing a real need and the real need was to credit the researchers for their effort and kind of say thank you the problem happened when they started escalating the stakes so from being a thank you game an appreciation game it became a money game and as with money the escalation started pretty fast i am not going to rant about bug bounties but i am not a believer in the present form of bug bounties had it retained the original thought process yeah that's very good but you see that bug bounties did try to fill a reactive need and what's happened now you have situations like this bug bounties have not remained bounties in the true sense but they've become sort of a trading platform a a, a weapons acquisition market if you have zerodium declaring a bug bounty for ios that's not really bug bounty the the spirit of the bug bounty means a vendor is buying the bug back i mean zerodium is definitely not going to give the bug to apple uh, not not after they paid a million dollars or now it's like 1.5 million and uh, it's 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 just getting out of control you you're acquiring bugs and then using it recklessly this is not what it was so my i mean my take on everything reactive is that don't play this game it's it's not going to benefit you it's just going to drain you out of money and time and publicity you're not really going to improve much i mean apple has now started a private bug bounty only like 8 or 9 people can contribute to it and they'll get paid but that's sort of like saying yeah we have an open bug bounty but not really open because apple doesn't really like anything open uh, anyway that's a subject that we can debate later uh, quickly cutting to how how users behave and user behavior is is one of my pet points has sort of devolved over uh, over several years especially over the two decades and the problem with user behavior is the well, users have remained the same and advanced technology is advanced sometimes you don't know how to use advanced technology and you you know step into an airbus and total it uh, this is what happens when users are given well, what do you think happens when users are given a smartphone with a camera they do this yeah i mean why not this was this was in august so how do you protect user safety when you kind of enable the user and made them feel good about tweeting pictures of their debit cards you know, whose fault is it the banks surely the banks are going to get blamed but uh, what do you do um, i uh, <clears throat> there there's several points that i you know agree and disagree with schneier but one of the points that i really agree with is you give the user a choice about security the users rarely going to make the right choice about security they, they will choose features fun and frolic over security any day if a pop up is bugging them from dancing pigs they'll click okay just to get to see the dancing pigs yeah, it's true so we've seen so far we've seen a very reactive approach to defense one of the things that has arisen out of this whole reactive approach to defense is a whole phenomenon called compliance something happens and there's compliance being enforced in the name of security there's a picture from my hometown where we have a law that riders of scooters and motorcycles must wear a helmet okay this picture is compliant but nothing to say about uh, this person's wife who's riding behind and if she gets uh, if they get into a wreck uh, she will have to be scraped off with a spatula it it is it is compliant but it's not secure so are these guys these guys are all compliant they they probably still are and they they're getting breached so the golden truth you and i know uh, attackers don't follow standards and certifications they never have they never will and what are we doing to defend in this manner if if you kind of go to a um, a large conference you see a picture like this so today's infosec defense is kind of boiled down to 
three or four major areas. I mean, you, you sum it up all, InfoSec defense is all about rules, signatures, and updates. We've learned how to do this for two decades, and oh, now we have this new thing called machine learning thrown in, as if it's going to solve everything for us. Where are we going with this? It's back to the same thing. It's, it's about being reactive. I mean, we know antivirus has, has its limitations. I'm not going to knock it because, yeah, it served its purpose. Frustrated me uh, sometimes. But um, we, don't, we don't sort of learn lessons from 10 years ago. And we have more statements coming up saying, OK, we stop 99% of malware attacks before they happen. Well, that's great. You thought about what the other 1% would occupy? Um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's the 1% malware that really matters in, in today's age. They end up owning everything. Well, then your antivirus gets machine trained on this. Then they'll detect it, only to be owned by the other 1% of malware. And this game keeps going on. And we've seen that existing strategies simply do not match attacker tactics. All right, so this is part one. We've, we've, we've come to a conclusion this, this is not going to be the way we're going to defend ourselves. Something's got to change. Um, so what is that change? Where are we headed in terms of defense if you want to do it right? The one thing I know is we have to switch our approach from being reactive to being proactive. And in a proactive defense can only happen when you have the proper intelligence gathered to defend yourselves. There's a lot to be said about intelligence as well. Um, and so many people say, so okay, you, do, you, do you mean that you should get threat intel feeds? Heck no. There's like little maps that shoot things against each other. Um, so where do you get your security and intelligence? Well, first thing, look within. You pretty much have all the intelligence you want to be able to defend your own organization. Know yourself is the first approach. Uh, if you simply look at your organization's data, it must be like generating a phenomenal amount of data, petabytes of data. There's where all your intelligence is. The thing is, what do we do with the data? We need to be able to extract proper intelligence from it. And this brings me to my, the rest of my talk on proactive security testing. Um, if only InfoSec learns from high velocity e-commerce and adopts the same process, we will stand a way better chance of defense. Let me give you an example. You see, you see a large retailer like Amazon or uh, a, a large e-commerce site. Not only do they sell very fast, but they keep a watch on every transaction. Where is the user looking? How are they clicking? Can we shorten the clicks? Are they using more mobile phones? Are they using more browsers? Uh, what's the bottlenecks in delivery? Can I, can I shorten this curve? It's all about analysis and actions. This process is very well established. They also generate petabytes or maybe like exabytes of data, but they have the power to analyze it. Surely we can as well when it comes to defense. So with this, I kind of thought of seven axioms of security, which I want to lay out to give you a, a broad guideline of what, what meaningful defense is going to be. And the first axiom is collect everything. By everything, I mean everything. This actually is a, uh, this is proven. One of our customers did it. They started collecting every HTTP request on all their web-facing applications. They're a bank in the United States. They started collecting every HTTP request since 2009. They have about a few petabytes of data in a homegrown Hadoop cluster, and they've kept it. They just started with one thing, we're going to collect it and see what we get. And then they started running 
modeling and anal analytics on it, trying to detect patterns. Frauds were happening and then they tried to look what led to the fraud. Historical data is your biggest asset in this case. And from this historical data, they learned so many things that they were able to improve their own homegrown fraud detection by so much that um, the, the, the frauds are way minimized and the program essentially pays for itself. They also ran the cost. It was like about $250,000 to fill up the hardware and another similar amount, like three quarters of a million dollars to run this program year after year. And this is nothing compared to the kind of frauds they saved. They were saving about four to five million in frauds simply using this, this, this strategy. And the strategy was based on the uh, security data warehouse, as they called it. And that is the first step to proactive security. And that's what set me thinking, saying, wait a minute, this is the way to go here. And look at Moore's law. Moore's law has proved that retention is cheaper than deletion. I haven't deleted anything from my computer in over like five years. I've just gotten a bigger hard drive. And, uh, so we, it doesn't matter. Be, be Google. Hoard every little byte you can. So it costs you nothing to store it. In, in fact, it's like kind of more painful to scrub it properly. And the more valuable, I mean, the more age the data collects, the more valuable it gets, like a good vintage. There is, I mean, the, the value of historical data increases exponentially with time. Um, whenever something happens, you can always go back and look and really narrow down several root causes which you never knew. Uh, this is not going to give you the answers for everything, but it's going to help you arrive at conclusions really quickly. Um, now, what do you do after you collect everything? Um, this, <coughs> the second axiom is, if you can't measure it, you can't use it. This thought process came from a talk given by Marcus Raynham. He's one of the guys I respect very much. And he was speaking at IT Defense uh, earlier this year in January in Mines. And I woke up actually early for his keynote, um, one of the few keynotes that I attended. And he made a point that security is all about metrics. What are metrics? Metrics are nothing but measurable units of InfoSec, or measurable units of anything. And it is it's like we really need metrics for several things to either show that you're succeeding or failing. These are basically his slides that I want to repeat over here. And uh, essentially to take informed decisions. His talk was all about how to establish metrics at a very high level. So you look through your process and make a note of what's quantifiable, measure it, track it if it's going up or down. And uh, the real reason why metrics are very important, it is this slide, which I like very much. It's uh, what he called a battle of two narratives. And this is typically what happens when decisions are being taken. Like some wizard will come and tell you that, oh, by moving to the cloud, you'll save half a million dollars per year. And they're pulling numbers from thin air. They've pretty much, you know, got nothing, nothing more than a wild thought over a cup of coffee, and they're, they're going to make a business case out of it. The only way you can call bullshit on it is if you have metrics. So if you don't, this guy is going to get his way, and, and your initiatives are going to be sideways. Uh, if you have the metrics, you can either credibly defend against it, or justify what you're thinking of, or maybe actually even prove that they're right and take the right decision in this case. I loved uh, Raynham's statement is, if you can't defend, then plan B is to come up with lies of your own if you don't have metrics. Uh, but uh, I've seen this with CISOs throughout the years. The main blockage for security is somebody from marketing comes and says, oh, if you do this, user experience is going to suffer. There's no way of measuring how many users are going to suffer. And I'm going to talk about users in a little bit. But if you actually measured and realize how many users are going to suffer, um, well, go for it. There's always collateral damage. We've kind of become numb to it, haven't we, in today's day and age. Um, right. The third axiom is if you really want to test, test like an attacker. I mean, if you want to do red team, do red team thoroughly. 
I've, I've like several instances of me walking into a red team engagement and the customer kind of starts throwing different rules like, oh wait, we got to wait for a production release. Don't test on production, you're going to kill it. Well, that's the idea, damn it. Um, don't perform intrusive testing. Uh, what, what's a non-intrusive penetration test? I mean, the, uh, the words are just conflicting, aren't they? And then, oh yeah, this is out of scope, that is out of scope, that is out of scope, so what do you want me to do, walk on the carpet? Um, and, uh, oh yeah, this is my favorite. Oh, test during off-peak hours. Basically from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Okay, whatever, you know. So I asked them, saying, okay, who are you more scared of? Uh, are you scared of attackers or auditors? And make a choice. If you're scared of the auditors, get a compliance report. I'll give you one for free and go away. It'll be all green. Save your time, save your money, don't bother me. Uh, but if it is attackers you're worried about, all these rules don't apply. Just do what an attacker does. Um, coming to users, this is Axiom 4. And this kind of was inspired by a tweet debate between the Grug, who is a very dear friend of mine in NSP. Um, it's like, it's high time we paid attention to user ratings. We, we've always talked about users, we've always told that users are stupid. No, they're not. Um, they can be incredibly smart and incredibly stupid. And there's, there's a curve. We, we've got to realize where we are with it. And that's what's going to make a big difference in our InfoSec landscape. So, yeah, this was the, the origins of the discussion is uh, the, the statement that user hardening efforts have barely made any progress compared to software hardening over the last years. And it is time we look at this really seriously from an organization's point of view. It's like, okay, using metrics, using data that you collect, who are your users? Who are they? What are they? How mature are they in terms of InfoSec practices? And your typical curve will always look like this you'll have a lot of users on the low maturity curve to begin with. The moment you start measuring, you start seeing this bell curve appear. And then what do you do? You kind of classify them. You, you know, there's, there's the hopeless users, yeah, there's the uninformed users, the proactive users, and the rock stars. Now, every user is different. You cannot use the same treatment for every user. This is the one big thing that organizations are doing and failing. If you try to force me to change my password 12 times a year, I will start writing it down. You know, it doesn't work that way. You, you cannot apply the lowest common denominator across your entire user base. So what do we do? First of all, the hopeless users, they're, they're always going to be an enigma. You give them anything, they'll do something stupid out of it. Uh, leave them alone. Right? On the other hand, you have the rock stars. Leave them alone too because they're doing the right thing. Maybe you want to learn from them. Maybe you want to convert your other proactive users to be rock stars too. Um, but your main target area are the uninformed users, this middle segment. The good thing about these people is if you guide them, they will end up doing the right thing. So your goal is to kind of shift the curve, take the slice of uninformed users, and push them more proactive. If, if you keep moving the graph this way, and you keep tracking the metrics, I believe you've got a very good game going. And this can be done through several things, through technology, through messaging, through like, you know, user feedback continuously. Like, hey, you're, up, you're using an old browser, do you want to update? Because if you don't, then well, this might just stop working. Don't be like Microsoft Clippy. Uh, that, that is not called being proactive user experience. Right. Fifth axiom is to set booby traps. And this was inspired by a dear friend of mine, Harun Mir, who actually has built his company on selling canaries and canary tokens. I mean, it's, it's time that honey tokens made a comeback. You know, see where your money is going. Mark it. Mark your data. Mark your transactions. And keep an eye on them. I have suffered three credit card frauds in this past one year, all from Citibank. And they've issued me a new card every time and then it, something happens, it gets breached. And I believe I'm not a stupid user. Um, something's happened. Now, this started, I started thinking, 
they issue credit cards in batches. What if they end up retaining a few cards themselves? And these few cards will never be used. And you just, just program these credit card numbers into anything that takes a regular expression. The moment you see activity on these unused credit cards, even if it is a simple lookup query, be very aware, like, okay, what's happening? Track down your process and you'll see, you'll see where this data is moving on the internet. You kind of catch where the leaks were, catch where the breaches were, and figure out something's happening before it really explodes. You, you find like one canary in the whole batch, invalidate the batch, you know, reissue them proactively before fraud start happening. I mean, this is a way of uh, seriously actively defending against, uh, against these threats. I encourage you highly to read, uh, read up about Canary tokens and see any YouTube videos of Haroon's talk. It's very, very inspiring. Sixth axiom is that analysis decides actions. Corollaries, basically, you will not take any action without proper analysis. So fair warning, for this one, there's a few block diagrams ahead. I generally don't like block diagrams, but I'm going to use them. So the way you want to do this, and this is what I saw with one of my banking customers, the guys who built the petabyte warehouse, is every new estimate, they kind of first estimated what impact it would have. So they decided very early on that we will not allow IE 6 to 8 in our organization. And they met with a lot of flag saying, oh, you're going to do this, you're going to break so many users. And they came back saying, no, we're going to break like about 13% of users. Let's break that. That's okay. The rest of the 87% will not complain and we will manage this. So they estimated that they would have about a week worth of customer calls and customer support issues. And uh, they, they launched the initiative. They started tracking it. They started tracking it over two weeks and found out that, okay, it didn't take a week, it probably took a whole month. That's okay, but uh, then they kind of went back to the feedback loop and revised their processes a little bit, introduced some new initiatives and started, started pushing changes. When initially every change is met with resistance, here you have a proactive way of pushing changes with proper effect and tracking. This is where you need to go. I drew a basic blueprint for a proactive uh, security defense architecture. It's something like everything has to feed into the security data warehouse. Every application, user activity, perimeter activity, collect, analyze, and then trigger actions wherever they're needed. All right, and that leads me to the last and the seventh axiom of, uh, of InfoSec which is a hard one to solve, hardest for the last. And this requires buy-in from the top. Now, this is where the most resistance happens. The sad part is that InfoSec is still a cost center to most organizations. It's not a money-making machine. And because it isn't a money-making machine, it takes uh, the, the sidelines. The approach is, okay, how, how much can we optimize spending in InfoSec and how can we like minimize this budget and just get the job done, just don't get the auditors in my face and, oh, I don't want to be on the press all over. These are the overall goals given to any CISO. Um, this is not going to change. The, the cost center approach is not going to say change. I mean, I don't know how InfoSec is going to start making money for you unless you like tell your banking red team to go attack other banks and steal money from them. Um, but otherwise, you're not going to make money. So what do you do? I was uh, then going through the job role of a CISO. And here is what a CISO needs to do. It's, it's a huge time suck with, with today's, uh, today's responsibilities on the modern CISO. But then again, you kind of find a little optimization area. If you can eliminate 10% of the tasks, it's going to free up 90% of the time that a CISO has to spend. And this 10%, you can't really see it very well, but in that little corner is something that says compliance and audits. Compliance and audits are not InfoSec. In fact, if you want to make an organizational change in the organizational, create a new business unit that just, just deals with audits sit them in a corner, pay them some money, 
and then tell them not to make noise, do whatever they need to do. But please move this functionality from under the CISO and put it somewhere else. Because honestly, it's not their circus, not their monkeys. Infosec CISOs need to be creative and need to make something, not scramble to keep on complying and fulfilling all hassles from all sides. This is going to seriously free up 90% of the time. And then you ask your question, is your InfoSec team doing something creative every day rather than just responding to rules, signatures, updates, and compliance requests? So, uh, well, that's pretty much the end of my uh, talk. I, I just have to do this. I got this hat at 44 con, a friend make it, made it. So it's time to make security great again. That's, that's what it says. Thank you very much. Questions or, or, or anything, comments? Any questions? The security hats, you can contact uh, Joe Fitzpatrick. He makes these. Really nice. Make security great again. He'll, he'll probably give them to you. We have a question in the back. Yes. Uh, objective method of uh, communicating to upper... Uh, yeah. So the objective metrics for communicating to the upper echelons um, First of all, failure rates, and show that if you know failure rates can be minimized. Um, attempts of attacks that have happened, user classification is, is a big thing, like, okay, here's, here's the users that we have. I'll give you an example about users. We had one, uh, one bank in India roll out a uh, fingerprint-based banking initiative, and they made a statement that, okay, with this, we're going to get rid of passwords forever, and everybody can use their fingerprints to log into internet banking from their phones. The, the fallacy here that was not backed up by numbers is that very few devices are touch, touch ID enabled or, or fingerprint enabled. So for the vast majority, it's still going to be usernames and passwords. Even for the users who have the touch ID, if they drop their phone in the toilet and get like a cheap knockoff phone, then they will degrade back to username and passwords. So to the attacker, Touch ID means just simply degrading to a, uh, a, a lower quality hardware device, and you get it. So these, once you have these type of metrics put in place, uh, you, you can make a very convincing point. Rest of it depends totally on the initiative that you want to launch. You, you think of an initiative like, say, a browser upgrade, or uh, you know, do you have more mobile users? Do you want to even invest more money into web-based applications, or do you still start want to killing, like still slowly start killing them? Um, that's what it's going to be. I I wish I knew the the answers, and maybe I can make like some process and offer certification around it, uh, and then drive compliance. No, sorry. I, um, any others? Yeah, I have one actually. Go ahead. You said to move audit and compliance away from the CISO? Yeah. Move it where? Uh, to another department. Which department? Well, you know, in Germany, they started creating bad banks. <laughs> That's, you have to create an audit department, I guess. Marketing. Why not? Uh, so, I'm very CISO. No, 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 seriously, it's, it's a, I mean, humor aside, I'll tell you, this job is, is like a full-time job in itself. If you put the two together, the CISO will never, the, the InfoSec organization will never get an opportunity to be creative. The only way is you got to move it out. Let audit do its audit job. CISO has got to survive the audit, period. But let's say I want a budget at all, right? So if you look at the whole thing there, the mind map for CISOs, yeah. the red box is my biggest elephant to get budget. Ah. Without that box, my budget decreases and I have to fight so much harder for any budget. Budget thingies are here. 
Yeah, use metrics to get other parts of budget. But I mean, that's what Marcus Renum says. I'm sorry? But InfoSec is a cost center, right? You said it is a cost organizations, center. Organizations still view it as such. It is a cost center until the bigwigs see that it is stopping other money from hemorrhaging. The uh, way many CISOs actually successfully implement metrics and show business value is by you put numbers, you put money, actual monetary values on yeah. risks, yeah. and then a risk reduction is a monetary benefit to the, to the corporation. Right. But then you need to have the, the risk and the compliance and the audit and the gaps in security so that you can measure and monetize on mitigation, risk mitigation. That's, I mean, that's true. We, we are stuck in this. The thing is, do we want to get out of this loop or not? Is a question. We can do this. I mean, that's fine. Do we want to get out of this loop and do something different or just still keep on doing this? Because after all, that is a reactive path. And I, 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 I wish I had better answers. I, I just don't. Yes. I think, I think the risk and analysis is not done only by auditors. It can be done also in the axiom where you analyze uh, the benefits of an action. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any f last question? If not, let's say thank you to Salmil and go thank for a much. coffee break. Thank you.